Christians run away from the culture because it's getting more liberal, but it's getting more liberal because Christians keep running away. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we build churches in Minecraft while talking about Christianity. And today we're talking about five different views of how Christians should relate to the culture, to the outside world. These views were categorized by a 20th century theologian named Reynold Niebuhr, who looked throughout all of church history and basically made five groups of perspectives that Christians over the years have had for how they should relate to the culture. So I'm going to tell you what they all are, I'm going to say who holds to them and why, like what biblical reasons they have for doing so, and at the end I'm going to say which view I hold to. So in order, the first one is Christ against culture, the second is Christ of culture, the third is Christ above culture, the fourth is Christ and culture in paradox, and the fifth is Christ the redeemer of culture. The first one, Christ against culture. This is your fundamentalist, retreatist model, which basically says Christ equals good, the world equals bad, and the job of the church is to follow Jesus and remove itself from the culture. So the people who hold to this view are generally Anabaptists like the Amish or fundamentalist Baptists, as well as some people in the early church who started living in monasteries. So look at the Amish. The Amish are very good at not getting stained by the sins of the world, but the reason that that works for them is they just remove themselves from the world entirely. I've heard that Amish people actually don't want to convert you to being Amish, they just want to be left alone by the rest of the world because they think the rest of the world is too stained by sin to be worth interacting with. And so they're from the Anabaptists, they're, and they're from like the pure you know, dark roast espresso Anabaptists, whereas modern Baptists are a more diluted version of Anabaptists. If Anabaptists are espresso, modern Baptists are like cafe Americano, so to speak. So a lot of independent fundamentalist Baptists are not as hardcore as the Amish, but they still have this mindset, this fundamentalist retreatist mindset, that the world is stained with evil and the job of the church is to retreat from the world to basically create a safe haven from the rest of the world. And the Benedict option, which is not Baptist, but is um, has a similar view to this, but not nearly as extreme as the Baptists, especially not as extreme as the Amish Anabaptists. The reason they have this view is because the Bible does say you must not love the world. Now, other people will interpret that to mean you must not love the ways of the world, or you must not love the spiritual forces of evil that govern the world. But if you do take a straightforward reading of you must not love the world, it does tend to support this model of, you know, Christ against culture. That the church shouldn't bother trying to fix the culture, the church just needs to separate itself from the culture. And this view tends to assume that the culture is a sinking ship, and the church's only job is to be a lifeboat to basically get people off the sinking ship. So, prominent people who hold to this view would be John MacArthur. John MacArthur is probably the famous, most famous reformed adjacent pastor who teaches this. I say reformed adjacent because he's not historically reformed in any sense, uh, but he still is a pastor that a lot of people listen to. He definitely strongly holds to this view. He has literally said, and I've heard him say this because I used to listen to him a lot, he has literally said Christians should exploit the environment because the entire world is going to get burned up anyway. So yeah, this is the um, this is definitely the Christ against culture model. Now the second one is Christ of culture. This is a very different model, and this is generally the model that liberal churches hold to. Liberal Protestantism basically developed this view. Uh, Protestant liberalism was a movement that started in the late 19th, early 20th century that tried to remove a lot of the supernatural elements from the faith including the divine inspiration of the Bible. They began to see the Bible as just a human text, as a text about humans doing their best to understand God, rather than divine revelation from God. So, Christ of culture, this model has only really been held by theologically liberal Christians, if you can even call them Christians in any historic sense, because the Bible clearly does show tension between the church and the world. So the Christ of culture model can only really be held if you have a lower view of scripture. 
And this model basically says there's really nothing wrong with the culture. The job of the church is to basically affirm what the church, what the job of the church is to basically affirm what the culture already values and basically say, hey, you know what you guys like? Jesus likes that too. So in the modern day, you see this with churches that will fly pride flags and stuff. Um, generally, this only exists in mainline Protestant churches. Not all mainline Protestant churches are liberal, by the way. I'm a mainline Protestant. I'm not liberal. So not all Episcopalian or United Methodist churches are liberal like this, but all churches that are liberal are in one of these mainline Protestant denominations. So whenever you see a church flying a pride flag or having a sermon that's basically just the 2024 Democratic platform, um, that's the Christ of culture model because it says, you know, the job of the church is to affirm what the culture already believes. And the reason they do that is because they don't think the church has really received any revelation from outside this world. They think the church is just um, a manifestation of something from this world. They think the Bible is a human text. They think the church is a human institution. So the job of the church then is just to affirm what the culture already values. So in modern times, that means pride flag churches. That means, I don't know, churches that uh, have a very left-wing view of social justice. But um, this wasn't always the case. Theological liberalism doesn't have a set of beliefs, really. It doesn't really have a clearly defined set of beliefs. Theological liberalism simply takes the mold of whatever culture it's in. So in 1930s Germany, the theologically liberal churches actually supported the Nazis. Why? Well, because the entire culture was supporting the Nazis, and the church didn't have a theological standpoint to really oppose what the culture believes. And a lot of the neo-Orthodox people, like Karl Barth and like Reynold Niebuhr, the guy who thought of these five categories, they took a strong stand against theological liberalism. Um, Karl Barth helped write the Barman Declaration, which was an anti-Nazi confession written by his confessing church. And his problem with the theologically liberal churches is that it leads to the church being complicit in whatever evil the, the culture is taking part in because the Christ of culture model, this theological liberalism, causes the church to just blindly agree with whatever the culture says. It causes the church to cave to the culture. So right now, our culture is all about, you know, LGBT and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, but when the next cultural trend comes along, the liberal churches are going to are going to shift their focus to whatever that is. So if the culture is Nazi, then the church becomes Nazi. Uh, but if the culture is LGBT, then the church becomes LGBT. I don't know what the next thing is going to be. I don't know. Maybe in, in 40 years, there's going to be a movement for the rights of AI, for the rights of robots, basically. And then the church is going to be supporting robot rights because the culture supports robot rights and they don't have this theological claim that the rest of the church is going to have, which says, no, AI isn't people because it doesn't have a soul the way that, you know, people do. But yeah, that's the Christ of culture model. I'm going to give biblical reasons for why each of these views exist, except for this one, it's kind of hard to do that because there really isn't much of a biblical support for this. You kind of have to have a low view of scripture to hold this view. I guess the best I could say, um, just to try and, you know, steel man their arguments, is they wouldn't make an argument from scripture, but they would see scripture as the manifestation of things that different cultures valued. So they would say, just like people back then were uh, understanding God according to what the culture values, we right now, today, are understanding God according to what our culture values. So yeah, that's the second view. The third view is Christ above culture. This is probably the most common in all of church history because it's the mainstream view of Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. It basically says that there is a temporary goodness to the culture, but Christianity and Christ has an eternal goodness that's way above the goodness of this culture. So that means they try to establish theocracies generally. Uh, historically, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox countries have always established some form of theocracies. Um, in the Middle Ages, you know, with the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Emperor had a lot of political control over the Orthodox Church, and in medieval 
medieval Europe, medieval Western Europe, there was a lot of uh, power shared between the Pope and between secular rulers. And the theological reasoning for this is that, yes, there is a temporary goodness of the world. This is what St. Augustine articulates in his Two Kingdoms doctrine, that, yes, there is a, an earthly kingdom that has some sort of temporary goodness, and the earthly rulers do have a responsibility to promote earthly goodness, but the church has a responsibility to promote eternal heavenly goodness, and the eternal goodness the church promotes will always be above the uh, temporary goodness that the culture promotes, but they still think the culture has the potential to be good in an earthly sense. So it's not a completely optimistic view of culture, it's not a completely pessimistic view of culture either. So unlike the first view, unlike the Christ against culture view, they don't think the culture is always going to be bad. That's why you'll see a lot of, you know, Catholic and Orthodox societies having a lot of pride in their culture. You see all those Serbian nationalists being, having a lot of pride in Serbian culture and also having a lot of pride in the Serbian Orthodox Church or whatever. Is there a Serbian Orthodox Church? I think so. Um, I, I don't know how the Orthodox Churches work. It's like which countries have their own Orthodox Church, which countries are like autocephalous, however that's... I don't know, orthodoxy is confusing. No matter what I say about Eastern Orthodoxy, the Eastern Orthodox keyboard warriors will always say, you just don't understand orthodoxy, bro, even if I literally repeat exactly what, I don't know, Father Josiah Trenum will say. Anyway, that's a tangent. So they don't have a completely pessimistic view of culture, but they don't have a completely optimistic view of culture either, because they still see any cultural goodness as temporary compared to the eternal goodness of Christ. So it's sort of a balanced view between Christ against culture, and also Christ of culture. And the biblical support for that is probably, I guess you could say, the Old Testament kingdoms. Uh, there was a lot of Old Testament typology used to justify Catholic and Orthodox views of culture. And that's, that's a very common thing that they'll do. And they do make good compelling arguments because I think this is, if not the majority, at least the plurality of the view within among church history think St. Thomas Aquinas, he definitely held to this view as well, this Christ above culture view. Now, the fourth view is similar in some ways. It's Christ and culture in paradox. So this culture does have a view of two kingdoms as well, but it's a more radical two kingdoms view. Christ and culture in paradox says that all Christians are citizens of two kingdoms. They're citizens of the earthly kingdom, of the kingdoms of this world, and citizens of the heavenly kingdom, which is the kingdom of God. And in some sense, of course, nobody could dispute this, because the Bible talks about the kingdom of God, but all of us are also uh, citizens of whatever earthly nation we're a part of. I'm a citizen of the United States. Uh, but unlike the Christ above culture view, this view generally does not advocate for any sort of theocracy or any sort of religious government, because this view sees a really sharp distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. So it's not a retreatist view. It doesn't say that you need to retreat from culture like the Christ against culture people would say, but they say that our citizenship in the kingdom of this, the, this world is very different from our citizenship in the kingdom of God. So generally the people that hold to this view are, you'll find a lot of classical Protestants these days that hold to this view, people in the PCA and the OPC in particular, um, radical Two Kingdoms theology from the uh, Westminster Seminary in Escondido, California would definitely promote a very strong version of this view. So they don't want Christians to necessarily retreat from culture, but they also say it's not the church's job to transform culture. Christians should just be good citizens of whatever culture they're a part of and promote earthly goodness in that culture according to natural law. But the uh, Christians should also be put their main focus on the church, which is the heavenly kingdom of God, and they don't necessarily see a lot of continuity between this age and the age to come. Just like the Christ above culture view, they think that the good things of this culture are temporary, uh, they're not going to last forever, so that Christians shouldn't put too much stock into this culture. Um, but unlike the Christ above culture view, they don't think the church has the, has the authority, or should have the authority, to basically rule over the culture, so they would not support any sort of theocracy. They would have a strong doctrine of separation of church and state. So Christians that typically hold to separation of church and state would definitely hold to this view, the Christ and culture of paradox view, in paradox view. 
Arguably, you could say Martin Luther held to this view. It, it's debatable, because while Martin Luther did believe in separation of church and state and two kingdoms in some sense, he still believed the church would have an impact on culture. So I would say Martin Luther held to like a very moderate version of this view, and people like um, a lot of people in the PCA, the OPC, and especially in the Escondido school would hold to a much more radical version of this view, the radical two kingdoms theology. I think this view was popularized by David Van Drunen. He is one of the he is one of the theologians in the Escondido school, and he wrote a book, Living in God's Two Kingdoms. He has a very radical version of Two Kingdoms theology. He says it's not even the church's job to serve the poor, which goes completely against like on the, the rest of Christian history. Now he doesn't say Christians shouldn't serve the poor. He say he would say it's the job of individual Christians on their own time to serve the poor and to help the culture, but it's not the church's job as an institution to do those things. Um, so he would not say that Christians shouldn't do good in the world. He would just say the church has a very, very specific job, and that's to um, proclaim the word and administer the sacraments and basically tend to people's spiritual needs, and it's our job individually to tend to people's physical needs. So basically a sharp distinction between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. And then the final view, the Christ the Redeemer of culture view, would strongly disagree with the previous view. The view, Christ the Redeemer of culture, very strongly says that it's the church's job to transform the culture. It's very transformationalist. So people who held to this view would be John Calvin held to like a moderate version of this view and uh, Abraham Kuyper and N.T. Wright would hold to very strong versions of this view, Christ the Redeemer of culture. So this view basically says the church's job of, in, in some way, the kingdom of God is not something completely separate from the kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of God is not of this world, but the kingdom of God is going to transform this world. And they would say part of the gospel message, part, part of the good news about the kingdom of God is that Jesus has become king of the universe, and he will eventually uh, consummate his kingdom at his return. But even before Jesus returns, in anticipation of that, we should be building the kingdom of God here on earth until then, until that happens. And in case you haven't already figured out, this is the view that I hold to. This is also the view that Reynold Niebuhr held to, the one who thought of all these categories. So he wasn't completely unbiased in categorizing these things. So my reasoning for thinking this way is that basically Jesus's message was all about the kingdom of God, and it did not seem like the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, was only about spiritual salvation. Like all the groups would have to say that, yeah, the gospel is about the kingdom of God in some sense, but other groups like the, the fourth one, the Christ and Culture and Paradox, the Radical Two Kingdoms view, they would tend to say, oh, the kingdom of God is mainly just spiritual salvation, and it might have an impact on this world, but that's not the job of the kingdom of God. Whereas people who who hold to the fifth view, the Christ the Redeemer of culture view, they would say, uh, no, that that actually that's exactly what the kingdom of God involves. That's not all that there is to the kingdom of God. Of course, there's spiritual salvation, but it's also the redemption of all creation. And there's one verse in particular that I think supports this view very well. Um, this is from Handel's Messiah. Uh, well, all of Handel's Messiah is directly quoted from scripture, I think. If not all, then at least the vast majority of it. But there's a verse, I think it's in Revelation or something, I'll put it on the screen. It says, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say Jesus' kingdom will replace the kingdoms of this world. It says, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Um, so what that means is that there is going to be continuity between this age and the age to come. It means that heaven is not going to be something completely separate from this world. Heaven is going to be just a redeemed version of this world. Because of that, it's our job to spread the kingdom of God here and now by transforming the culture. This is a very mainline Protestant view. Reynold Niebuhr was a big influence in the mainline Protestant churches. And I think all the other views are honestly insufficient. I would say the second best would be the Christ above culture view because it still emphasizes the church's duty to um, the church's duty to have influence over culture. But the Christ above culture view still doesn't do enough to insist that the good things of this world will be restored. 
So I don't think the good things of this world are entirely temporary. I think every beautiful thing of this world will be redeemed, will be resurrected. Like the resurrection isn't just a resurrection of the spiritual, isn't just the resurrection of our souls. It's the resurrection of the physical too, not just our physical bodies, but the resurrection of all creation. I think that, you know, Bach's music that was created to the glory of God will be present in the new heavens and the new earth. I think everything good of this world will be present in the new heavens and the new earth because Christ is here to redeem this world. I don't believe that God would create anything good just to throw it away. And uh, there are a lot of Bible verses that talk about the restoration of all things. The word in Greek is apokatastasis, and some have interpreted apokatastasis to mean universal salvation, which I do not hold to. Um, I don't believe in universal salvation, but I do believe in the salvation of the universe. In other words, I don't think every individual person is going to be saved because Jesus clearly talks about hell as a real thing that's going to happen to some people. But the Bible also talks about the redemption of all creation, not just the redemption of individual souls. And I really don't like individualistic forms of Christianity. That's why, in case you couldn't tell, I really don't like the Christ against culture view. I think the whole Christ and culture and paradox view is not that much better because it still sort of dissuades Christians from getting involved in culture. So yeah, those are generally the five models. Thank you guys for watching, and I'm going to speed this up while I finish that path between my church and my seminary.